if you are thinking about applying to genetic counseling programs in the US or in North America and you'll be an international applicant, check out this whole video. Welcome to Genetic Counseling Awareness Channel with Katie Lee. All the best resources you'll ever need at Genetic Counseling Awareness Channel. Hi guys, it's me, Katie Lee, CGC, and welcome back to Wannabe Wednesdays. If you've been enjoying my videos, please like this video, please subscribe, and ring the little notification bell so you can be notified when I release new videos. This video has been a long time coming. I have had a lot of questions from those of you who are planning to apply to Genetic Counseling School internationally, and today I have two experts, two women who applied internationally and are going to be attending Genetic Counseling School this fall. So if you are thinking about applying to genetic counseling programs in the US or in North America and you'll be an international applicant, check out this whole video. Also check out the description down below because there are about a dozen really helpful links and places to look for resources. Let me tell you a little bit about the interviewees today. So Sharanya is a senior undergraduate from Bangalore, India. She is currently pursuing, or I suppose wrapping up her Bachelor of Engineering in Biotechnology. She works as a genetic counseling intern for a telehealth startup. She was a first time applicant for 2021 admissions and she'll be going to Emory this fall. The other interviewee is Vanessa. Vanessa's from Goa, India. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in biotechnology engineering in 2019. Since then, she's worked as a genetic counseling assistant at a cancer genetics clinic in Mumbai, India. She currently works at Slam Out Loud, which is a nonprofit that brings art-based learning to children coming from low incomes. She will also be attending the Emory Genetic Counseling Training Program this fall, and she matched on her second cycle. Another thing that was so fun about this interview is that Sharanya and Vanessa are friends and they actually attended the same undergraduate university, but they met on the Discord GC chat channel. So it is a, I wanted to say it's a love story, but no, it's a friendship story through Discord, which I'm sure there's quite a few genetic counselors and genetic counseling applicants who've become good friends through that Discord channel. So you definitely want to check out that if you haven't yet. So let's get into it, shall we? Hi, Sharanya and Vanessa. I'm so happy to have you here today for my YouTube channel. How are each of you doing? Good. I'm, good. I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you yeah. so much for having us. Yeah, I'm really excited. I think this is something that we've discussed and we've always wanted to do, wanted to get out this sort of information that we have. And there isn't like one sort of resource for international students. And it's, it's great that you're doing this video. It's really going to help a lot of applicants. Yeah, I've had a lot of applicants or just people who are interested in genetic counseling who haven't kind of figured out what to do next reach out to me. So I'm really excited to get it out there, too. Um, so why don't each of you tell me, maybe Sharanya, you could go first. Tell me about how you became interested in, interested in genetic counseling, how you heard about it, and then kind of decided that was the path you wanted to pursue. Of course. Um, so uh, I heard about genetic counseling when I was like 18. I was in high school and um, my cousin had just been diagnosed with a genetic condition. And I, we all, the whole family thought, you know, there is no, like, we don't know who to go to right now. We don't know if, you know, who, who can guide us about this. This is something which is very new. We don't, we don't know how to navigate this and um, a lot of misdiagnosis. And um, from that point on, I started searching for support groups, which could help him. And finally, we came across uh, a great support group. And I was really interested in their research work. And, you know, um, and I thought, you know, let me volunteer here. And I think that's when I first met a clinical geneticist, um, not a genetic counselor. And I think, you know, I was like, this is what we were looking for, you know, the kind of resources that they offer. And this is the kind of help that our family needed. So that was my first introduction. And um, we used to like conduct awareness camps uh, in rural areas in India. And I think that was when I really could see the geneticist in action and helping so many people. And I think that was when it really hit me that this is something I would really enjoy doing. You know, it sort of integrates my interest in science and of course, like working with people. Um, so I think that's how I decided that I wanted to get into GC. And what did you, what will your degree be in? Your undergraduate um, degree? So my undergraduate degree is Bachelor of Engineering in Biotechnology, mm -hmm. and I graduate this year. All right. Okay. Vanessa, what about you? How did you hear about genetic counseling? 
Yeah, so um, when I was in school, I had this genetics lecture, which got me really interested in studying genetics. But in India, there isn't a lot of there aren't a lot of bachelor's degrees specializing in genetics itself. So I ended up studying biotechnology. And during my about my third year in undergrad, I came across this book I was reading. It's called Still Alice by Lisa Genova, uh, and she talks about a genetic counselor in it. And it was around the same time that I was watching this TEDx video, um, which was by a certified genetic counselor whose name is Jacqueline Haven, and you can find it anywhere on YouTube. And she spoke about how she helped patients um, during a very challenging time in their life. And I really appreciated that you know genetic counselors really promoted patient autonomy and uh, could support patients during a really hard time in their life. And you know, that just got me interested in the field. And I ended up reaching out to more genetic counselors in India, as well as across North America. And, you know, that really strengthened my interest in the field itself. That book, that book is a sad book. I'm going to link it down below, but it is, a, that was a sad book. I remember reading that one while I was an undergrad too, actually. Um, now, how did each of you decide where to apply? And I actually don't know if each of you applied just in the United States or if you were applying to a variety of different genetic counseling programs across the world. So I applied to genetic counseling programs two times. So the fall 2020 cycle was the first time I applied and didn't end up matching. So that was the time I applied to programs in the United States as well as Canada. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And at that time, I was not really sure about what exactly I wanted in a program. And after receiving feedback from schools and also interviewing at a couple of schools in my first cycle, I realized the kind of things that I was looking for. Um, and that um, helped me get some clarity when I was applying to schools the second time. So um, like what I wanted, whether I wanted to live in a bigger city, whether I wanted access to a diverse patient population, Mm -hmm. um, having an uh, attached healthcare system in the university itself. Those were a few things mm -hmm. that I considered when, you know, applying to schools in my second application cycle. Mm -hmm. Yep. What about you, Sharanya? Um, so yeah, pretty much like Vanessa, I initially, I didn't, um, actually have, I didn't narrow down, uh, any country I was looking in general because in India, we didn't have a lot of, uh, master's programs and, um, from what I heard from other students who graduated, I felt like um, they didn't have enough of the psychosocial curriculum and something was always missing. And so mm -hmm. I started looking at other countries. And when I finally, you know, I settled with US and I, I met Vanessa and we started talking and, you know, she gave me all her insight about her first application cycle. And, you know, that's when I was like, I have to start shortlisting these programs based on these kind of factors and um, I started reaching out to places I tried to talk to students who graduated if international students from programs um, and you know I or like program directors and just to get like the sense of you know what kind of a program they are and if I could see myself there um, because I think as an international student you you're going to be you're going to be like shifting your entire life uh, to another country so it's a lot of factors that you have to consider. And for me, a lot of important things included um, the sort of diversity in class and you know how inclusive uh, the program would be and uh, the kind of efforts that were taken for you know diversity, equity, inclusion, and mm -hmm. also how they would support international students and um, the location, if it's in a city or if it's far off, and uh, things like that. So, you know, I, that's how I shortlisted my program. Mm -hmm. So you guys have known each other for a while now. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I bet it was yeah. nice to have a buddy, an uh, application buddy. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and we both matched to the same program. So that's yeah. amazing. We, we graduated from the same school and we oh. matched to the same school again. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't happen really ever, I yeah. feel like. Yeah. So tell me about meeting your prerequisites from another country. I feel like that's something I get a really big question about, like, how are you going to shadow genetic counselors, depending on what city you live in internationally? And how, were you able to find the counseling and the advocacy experience? And how did you go about that? 
Um, so I can go first. So for me, I think my first, um, you know, meeting with the geneticist itself, I was able to shadow. I had uh, a couple of cases that I could shadow. Uh, but then after that, I think it was very difficult for me to find shadowing opportunities uh, because A, there are not a lot of JCs and B, even if they are they're really far off in travel wise, it was difficult or I'd have to like move to some other place and I'm, I'm still in school. So, you know, that would be difficult. Um, but in terms of advocacy, volunteering um, and crisis counseling, I think there are plenty of opportunities. Um, I think you will have to do your research. I'm sure in your neighborhood or, you know, um, there are pl- like even virtual opportunities, even especially with COVID. Um, so I think there are a lot of opportunities. If you like do the research, you will definitely come across a lot, a lot of these places, uh, support groups and um, like crisis helplines and all of that. And I think those really help um, in terms of getting like a better sense of, you know, whether I, w- I can actually see myself in this kind of profession. And I think that's very important. Um, Even though there weren't a lot of shadowing opportunities for me, I think you have to get creative and there are different ways uh, to sort of get that genetic counseling exposure. And um, there were a lot of webinars and talks, case conferences that I attended. And I eventually ended up getting an an internship in a telehealth organization. And I did a lot of social media management for them and all of that. And I think any of this is a great learning opportunity. It's just, you will have to sort of be able to reflect and tell them what you took away from that experience. And I think that should still be good enough. Yeah. Um, So when it comes to prerequisites, like taking uh, science courses um, in India, since I studied biotechnology, most of the courses like um, biochemistry or like the biology courses or biostatistics, those were all covered in undergrad itself. But I did have psychology, which uh, we did not study in undergrad itself. So I looked out for online courses that I could take, um, like which were about a couple of weeks, maybe about six to eight weeks. And you usually find them. Um, I I actually signed up for one which was through a community college in the US and it was fully virtual and self-paced, uh, not self-paced, sorry. It was about six to eight weeks and you have to submit an assignment at the end of each week. So it was very flexible with you know what I was doing at that time as well. And when it comes to shadowing opportunities in India, there are very few uh, genetic counselors who are both certified by the American Board of Genetic Counseling, especially in India. So, and a lot of them don't even allow students to shadow them while they are in clinic. So um, you really have to reach out to a lot of people. And uh, there is a board of genetic counseling in India itself. And I reached out to someone uh, who was part of it and was able to, you know, connect me with other people, other genetic counselors in India um, who would, who could help me with shadowing opportunities. Uh, So you do have to mail a lot of people. It's not easy. Uh, you have to you have to continuously follow up with a lot of people if you do want a shadowing opportunity. Um, but during COVID, what has changed is there have been a lot of webinars, like Sharanya said, especially um, organized by genetic counseling programs in the US, um, and that helps you get like a understanding of the program. You get to interact with the faculty and the students. Um, so you're learning about the field as well as you're learning about the school. So I felt that was um, something I really appreciated during this application cycle. Um, and about uh, advocacy and volunteering opportunities, I, like Sharanya said again, you really need to get creative with this. I um, shared, I only had shadowing um, experience the first time when I applied and I did not end up matching to a program. So that's not a guarantee that you would end up matching. Uh, but the second time around, I did not continue my shadowing experience. In fact, I did a lot of these webinars or like free online courses about genetic counseling. Um, and I volunteered at places uh, and did work that I really enjoyed. Like I currently intern with uh, with, an, with a nonprofit 
that you know brings art based learning to children from disadvantaged communities and um, even though i was not learning about genetic counseling i was gaining a lot of more skills that would really help me as a genetic counselor um, so yeah just be creative and um, you'll find your you'll find the perfect fit in your uh, volunteering experience as well and when you can really talk about it during your interviews schools also want to see um that you have other interests outside of genetic counseling as well and if you're able to talk really passionately about it i think that makes a huge difference okay good so it sounds like it maybe takes a little bit more persistence um yeah. ingenuity to find the right opportunities but they're out there and i agree the webinars in this past year and like the end of 2020 and 2021 there they've been there've been so many of them. I'm curious how you guys heard about them. Like the primary way that I've been seeing them is through Instagram accounts that um that are like genetic counseling focused. How did you guys what was the best resource for you to identify those different genetic counseling webinars? Yeah, so um about in May or June last year, uh I was I had just joined uh Twitter and I came across all of these webinars which were related to genetic counseling. and uh, i reached out to um, someone on discord itself and asked whether i could put together like a list of all the webinars i had found so that it would also help other applicants at the time um and from there <laughs> onwards it just you know it just um, continued like a lot of other people who were finding all these really amazing webinars added to the list and we had like a whole resource of it Mm -hmm. And I'll link the Discord group down below because if you haven't joined it, you have to. I mean, it's the most supportive group, and there are so there's more resources than you'll have time to access and and use. Um, and I'm also actually really funny that I met Vanessa on Discord, even though we went to the same school <laughs> and everything. We're messaging each other on Discord, and I'm like, I graduated from here, and she's like, do. And we're like, wow! And we met on a global platform. <laughs> this is this is crazy. And also to just add uh, on to what she said before about shadowing opportunities. Even though I couldn't shadow genetic counselors, I was able to shadow fetal uh, imaging specialists, maternal fetal medicine uh, doctors, um, as well uh, OBGYNs. And I think that also really gives you like an interesting perspective. You really like learn to contrast uh, between the roles of a GC. and the roles of an mfm specialist and i think that also really helped because i was able to talk about that in my ps and said you know this is why i want to be a gc and this is this is the difference um that i saw in the roles of you know a doctor and a gc um so i think that is still um possible if you can get in touch with doctors and they do agree to you know let you shadow then you could um shadow them and that's an amazing yeah, idea yeah yeah and that would make you stand yes. out a little bit. Very I don't familiar. know anybody who's doing yeah. that. So, I love that idea. Yeah, yeah. really any type of doctor would be would be an interesting experience and you could speak about that specialty um since genetic counselors kind of interface and are on multidisciplinary yeah. teams when, with most. Absolutely, because you will be working with doctors and I think it's it really is an interesting perspective um to you know learn about from from their point of view and from a gc's point of view um and you know in india they are familiar with the fact that there aren't many gc's and you know they know that and a lot of times it's the doctors who do the counseling so you know it is still a great opportunity and i think any of this is a learning opportunity so i would say you have to be flexible um and not say i only want to shadow a gc but also go out there and try to get these different opportunities you you will definitely have to get creative mm -hmm. like when as i said i'm wondering if there's anything that us genetic counselors who are practicing in the us could do to support international applicants like for me in my setting i know i could easily i mean the time difference is a bit of an issue but i work early morning hours and if somebody was flexible and had the ability to shadow during my work hours i don't see why i couldn't um shadow have a genetic counseling somebody interested in genetic counseling in a different country uh work with me i mean especially since i work remotely it actually isn't a stretch beyond having anyone who's somewhere else in the us come and shadow me for a couple of days so would it be helpful like what could we do would it be helpful to have a list and like what the work hours are and what your specialty is or how could how could genetic counselors help international applicants so um 
like i took a lot a lot of help and support from genetic counselors in north america i reached out for a lot of informational interviews mm-hmm. uh, then when interview season came around i uh, you know just put out a tweet asking for anyone to help me with mock interviews and i received like so many uh, messages from all genetic counselors and that was really helpful um also a, a gc who i did an informational interview with um, you know she asked me whether i would like to join one of the case conferences that she had at her workplace and um, that gave me another like an additional insight into the profession and also how genetic counselors work on a day to day basis and also um, i got to learn about a couple of interesting cases that you know um, they were working with on uh, working on at that time um So yeah I think that's how genetic counselors can help and even if students are like students like us who are in a different time zone and probably can't shadow you during your work hours maybe uh, GCs could help them with um, you know discussing interesting cases maybe mm-hmm. once every month or something like that just to get them to understand the work that you do in clinic How do you figure out which schools accept international applicants and like To me I tried to do the research on my own and it was very unclear on some of the program websites. So how did you go about of all the North American schools um whittling down your list of where you could apply and where was the best place to find that information? Yeah, I I let Sharanya answer this first. <laughs> okay, so I think it is really um a lot of work. Um you know, I did it the old school way. I went through each and every website. I look you know when you go like scroll down to the bottom they will there will be some sort of requirements that they have and it will be written and be like if we can only accept permanent residents slash US citizens so if that's the case if that is what it is then I will stop researching about that program and I will just move on and also on discord there, there is an international applicants channel where we usually ask questions like you know does if you're like really exhausted you can't really search and figure it out then just you know ask a question say do you know does this program accept international students just you know anyone know and um a lot of people have been helpful and they respond but if it's not mentioned on the website and if no one knows you have no other way but to just uh mail them or you know look at their alumni or something and see if they have an international student uh which is also a lot of work but yeah i think we have reached a point where there is a list of places that doesn't accept international students and that's already on discord now so um Good. that would be helpful <laughs> yeah <laughs> for anyone now <laughs> if anyone wants uh, to know about schools that don't accept international students we have a list they can reach out to us and talk more yeah. about it and yeah. what what percentage of schools does it feel like like is it a short list or is it like a third of the programs in the US do you have a feel for that um there are a couple in the US itself which don't allow international students i won't say the like maybe about um 10 maybe within the range of 5 okay 5 yeah i think i don't i thought there were a lot more i off the top of my head yeah i can think of quite yeah. a few yeah so i wouldn't say one third of all the programs currently but about maybe in the range of 5 to 10 programs mm-hmm. yeah 5 okay. to 10 okay yeah um Tell me about applying as an international student. Like is there anything that is an, an extra barrier or that made it a little bit more difficult difficult? I know some of the stuff like I remember I applied now, you know, like 8 years ago, but I had to mail a lot of things. Like I had to mail transcripts from my undergrad. How does that all work as an international applicant? Is it just a little bit slower and you still use the snail mail or how to go? Yeah so for transcripts we were allowed to attach scans of it um like uh, copies of us a transcript uh, during the application i took on the psychology course where i did need to send an additional transcript and you needed to pay about i think 10 to 11 dollars every time you sent that transcript so that was an additional cost um as well as since um like we get our grades and it's on a Uh, a 10 point scale like a gpa so that does need to be translated to a 4 uh, gpa so that s- schools in the united states can understand when they're going through your application and you need to do that through um, a service called world education services 
so you need to send them like a copy of your mark sheet and a couple of other documents from your undergrad itself you have to make a packet and mail it to them and then um, so it's a very costly affair because i think that costed about 2 to 300 dollars and every time you send out a, a wes evaluated transcript it costs you a lot of money about 30 to 35 dollars each time depending on delivery so it's a very very expensive process sending your transcripts during it. and also if you're applying to a lot of schools like i did um, it can turn out to be quite it can really burn a hole in your wallet yeah and also i think in addition to uh, the wes evaluation some of the programs require you to also send in your transcript so then i'll have to send an in an international courier which can again cost about 30 40 dollars and so it does get very expensive um there are some programs which are a little flexible about this they are okay with you know whichever grade uh, point scale it is 4 or 10 so you will not have to send it to them uh, but there are some which like ask for this and i think in terms of having west also in your schedule now you will have to manage a lot of things within that timeline and send it in within that deadline so it's a lot more organizing and you know in there's gre and also international students have to take toefl so that, there's that and you'll have to send your gre scores your toefl scores and then west and all of that each of the things you'll have to pay and then your transcript and then your if you're taking extra courses then transcripts for that so it's a lot of organizing excel is your excel is your god that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like I'm just seeing that timeline of like starting to prepare in August, just going earlier and earlier and earlier with all of those additional requirements. Okay, that's really helpful. What about interviewing as an international student? Now, I know that interviews have been remote with, with COVID, but I think everyone's wondering what's going to happen in the future um, now that we see that remote interviews work just fine. But tell me, well, Vanessa, the first time you applied what what were interviews like what was that before that yeah. was pre covid right yeah so uh, international students generally do have virtual interviews itself okay so uh, i've not heard about any international student who had to travel to the us in person oh, for an interview so it was pretty accessible that way for us and um, i think the only difference the first time when i applied pre covid was um, you know the programs that i interviewed with uh, would do it at a time which was good for me and for them. So it was, a, um, I usually had interactions with just the program director, the assistant program director, um, and a couple of the other who are, other GCs who are on the program leadership itself. But I would not uh, be able to have interactions with any current students. There wouldn't be any group activities. So I missed out a little bit on those parts of the interview. But uh, this time during this cycle, um, or since all the interviews were virtual, I was able to participate in, you know, the student meet and greet and um, even interact with other applicants on that interview day. So that was really helpful. But were they in the middle of the night for you? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they were. <laughs> had interviews, um, you know, beginning maybe from 6 to 7 in the evening like this and going up till 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. <laughs> I remember. Um, yeah, I had like a couple of interviews which were during that time, about 2 to 3 a.m. at night. And uh, the programs want, you know, they want to make sure that you have the whole experience as well. And I really did like being a part of the whole interview day. Uh, so, you know, I was willing to give up on my sleep for a couple of days for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the same experience with me. I had one of my interviews went to like 6 a.m. So I had to stay up the entire night starting from 9 p.m. to like 6 a.m. in the morning. I was awake the entire time and I even fell asleep at the end. But um, it was fine. <laughs> I got to it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was um, I was really excited about the program and I really liked it. So I wanted I really wanted to be and I, I know they, they understood that, you know, they knew that, you know, I'm interviewing from a different time zone and and all of them were being so nice and they were trying to finish off a little early. And, you know, they're like, OK, we're going to let you go. It's OK. Um, you can take a break and, and all of that. And um, so I, but, you know, I just I you had to do it. Like, I mean, I think it's OK. You can as students, you probably stay up a lot. 
anyway so we can do it once or twice yes. for a program it's fine wow yeah that adds a new dimension to like interview anxiety and yeah. <laughs> things did you guys take a nap before the interview started to try and get yeah. some sleep yeah okay yeah yeah also i'd like to add that you know having the interviews in the evening at you know late into the night uh, means that everyone in your house is sleeping so there's no there, there aren't any distractions my dog wasn't barking which was great because he barks a mm-hmm. lot during the day and no one's using the wifi so you have like a really good network at that time so you know there will not be any glitches or anything so those were the you know just the pros of it um yeah <laughs> the cons of it could be that you start zoning out sometimes uh when they're asking questions you're just like you know your your outline seconds and you're like oh yeah yeah and like you know sometimes your brain doesn't work but it's okay it's totally normal but as i, I like think they understand like that. that so um yeah <laughs> and some programs have really tried to you know make make sure that the slot comes in it's not that i don't have to stay up at on godly hours i i could still finish it uh, before like 10 pm or something so yeah and I, but sometimes i think the situation is unavoidable like if you have a group interview or if there's like um a presentation as the program in the end mm-hmm. at the end of the interview day so um that time you'll you'll have to you'll have to stay up so that's yeah it is what that's it is it. yeah it is what yeah. it is <laughs> um so i'm curious kind of on that topic it sounds like you definitely both prefer that you would get to be involved in the group activities and see the program presentation even if it means sacrificing a night of sleep or part of your night of sleep do you have any ideas for how gc programs in the united states can make the programs more accessible is there anything like we talked about the fact that sometimes it's hard to find the information but you guys told me a solution for that there's a list um what else can programs do to make the process a little bit easier in terms of applying and then the interview process if anything so i think uh one thing that we really found helpful because of covid was the fact that they had webinars and open houses so you we already had like a really good idea of how the programs worked um so you know it was the, the the interview day was sort of like a second run of whatever we'd heard in the webinar or the open house and we already had pointers or things that were written down and the questions we could ask and i think even post covid if they could continue with webinars and open houses being virtual it really would help international students because if there weren't these virtual webinars and open houses it's definitely very difficult to gauge a lot of um you know the culture of the program mm-hmm. and just a lot of questions that you have you wouldn't be able to ask we'll have to mail them every time so um i think if they did continue with the virtual open house i think it would be helpful even for american applicants as well or canadian applicants or any other international or people in different time zones you know mm-hmm. they would not have to actually fly across the country just to attend that open house if they could have the virtual opportunities and in person both but you know that that would just in, in terms of that if they could be flexible i think that would be really good another thing that i would like to add about uh, making genetic counseling programs more accessible um to international students especially is uh, genetic counseling is not recognized as a stem program as in it like after you graduate international students um don't get the opportunity to complete they don't get an opt extension opt is optional practical training so most programs just have 12 month of uh, 12 months of tra- optional practical training um during which you can work in the united states after you graduate so um if a program is listed as a stem program you get an extension of about 24 months so you get a total of about 36 months of uh, optional practical training during which you can work in the us and you know build your network uh, during that time um so a very few like just a handful of programs right now uh g- genetic counseling programs which are considered um to be part of this stem program list um and it would be really helpful for you know more programs to get on the same track and you know, make sure that genetic counseling is also a stem program oh that's really interesting i wasn't aware of that and it seemed obviously genetic counseling is is a stem program so yeah okay good advice for program directors and assistant program directors out there yeah and um 
also like a lot of schools when you ask them about this when i reached out to programs to find out whether you know uh, they have this opt extension uh, you know for their program a lot of a uh, lot of programs did not have any idea of what i was talking about so i had to reach out to a lot more people maybe the international student services um and mm -hmm. like and then it was a long process which of course ended almost now when you know interview season had ended and um, i was finally making my rank list as well this is something that factored into you know making my whole list whether this was a stem program or not mm -hmm. uh, because it's one of the important considerations as an international student mm -hmm. sharan so, i do not want to add anything more to that yeah i think she pretty much covered this but um we were th we thankfully were able to learn about this uh process even before we applied um that is because we did a lot of inf informational interviews and a lot of indians who went there and are practicing gcs now are aware of this and uh -huh. unless a program has taken international students and that student has faced these issues um they will not know about it or if there is an international um person on the committee they will not know about this um issue at all so most of them are are clueless and i think really having that stem opt is really helpful because uh, you want that experience you want to work and i think you know you will uh, be able to establish yourself uh, in uh, in the field and just having 12 months uh, is not enough and genetic counseling is very much a stem program so you know why not just go for it um, mm -hmm. and get that recognition so yeah that i think definitely i would want other applicants as well to know before applying uh, because they definitely factors in mm -hmm. okay good and then this is another thing i tried to research on my own that was really confusing to me how do you pay for graduate school as an international student like i know the options that i had in terms of federal loans and private loans but what are your options besides funding school yourself so i think um, this is like a huge decision so um typically there is, uh, you can't really wait until the end and decide oh this is how i'm going to fund school if you want to do it you will have to be 100% sure that you know you have all the resources uh even before applying and what i did was the first thing is look at all of this if i can apply for student loans if there are scholarships um international students don't really have a lot of scholarships um in the states so you and you'll also have to pay international student tuition um in the in different schools the tuition is higher um so you will have to sort all of this out um before and i think again that also factors in um uh, into your decisions um when you're ranking schools um and some fellowships they do offer uh, irrespective of your citizenship um but otherwise i think i would say you have to uh, look into a lot of um loans from india you can take i mean in india if you're looking at that then there are a lot of student loan options um that you can uh, take and you, know, you can take it with the help of your parent um and yeah that's that's how it works um here in india where like at least i am very privileged to have support from my parents um, they're going to be able to help me fund my education like a part of it and i also will be taking out education loans during the next two years hmm. all right i think those were all of the questions i wanted to ask are there any other tidbits that would be helpful for international applicants anything we didn't touch on that was just a learning experience for you as you were going through the application process so i think uh, one thing that i want to say really is that you have to do your research there is no shortcut um, it takes a lot of time and there are people who are willing to support you um that you know every gc that i have reached out to is really helpful and they're very supportive and they've you know given so much advice and they've always had such interesting discussions um and i would say make use of these resources all you have to do is not even send an email just shoot a tweet like that's how it is twitter is so active and so um i think you'll have to put in the effort it is definitely not easy nothing is ready made will have to go out there and get those opportunities and i think it's an incredibly personal journey as well so you also learn a lot um throughout this entire application process and i think that's i think that's really valuable at the end of it um so yeah you'll have to it takes about like at least a year of 
uh, just like getting all of these things together and mentally preparing yourself and just figuring everything out. It really takes that, it takes that much time. So there is no shortcut. Yeah, uh, totally agree with Sharanya on this. And uh, I felt like what was, what helped me the second time around when I was applying was making a timeline of all the things um, that I needed to complete before application season started, like taking my GRE, TOEFL, uh, then getting uh, this WES evaluation sorted because WES usually takes about uh, over a month or so. And during COVID, it took even a longer time. Um, so to have all these things in mind before you, you know, decide to dive into uh, applications and also keep a, create a, a, like a Google sheet or an Excel sheet to keep a track of all the requirements because they change from school to school. And if you are applying to a lot of schools, it can get really confusing, um, you know, when application season comes around. Um, talk to current students because they can really give you a better understanding of how the program works with the ins and outs of it and you'll really understand the whole vibe of the program and whether you would fit in there um talk to genetic counselors from north america um, or maybe even if you're planning to apply to programs elsewhere in in the uk or australia talk to genetic counselors uh, who are maybe international students as well that could be a little bit tricky to find out but uh, currently there is this great resource called uh, the minority genetic Com genetics professional network um, and there are a lot of gcs who, who i was able to get in touch with through that network i was able to be a part of this mentorship program and i received a lot of support during that time from another international gc student as well um, and another thing would be to listen to uh, podcasts about genetic counseling, even if you're unable to get any shadowing experience, you could attend webinars, you could listen to podcasts, do informational interviews, um, try to find advocacy opportunities or volunteering opportunities that you really have an interest in. They need not be related to genetic counseling. Um, yeah, and, and just try to, like when interview season comes around, try to do as many mock interviews as you can, especially with other genetic counselors, with uh, other students who may be applying, or even with your friends or relatives, because they can give you uh, some of the best uh, feedback that you need. And you can really, you know, work on it during that time, you know, while you're waiting for interviews, uh, interview notifications to come up. Yeah, and the last thing would be, uh, is really just network with all the genetic counselors. I think it's such a great community. And it it was really the genetic counselors um, that I interacted with who helped me get through this entire cycle this past year. Also, one more thing I wanted to add, there are some programs, um, some programs have waived GRE, uh, but also there are some programs which um, uh, don't require TOEFL. Oh. They're willing to waive TOEFL off as well. Um, so I would like recommend trying to reach out to the program and asking if TOEFL is compulsory um, because you we we did study in an uh, English um, medium uh, you know university. Uh, so if your medium medium of instruction was English, then you know they have said you know you don't have to submit the TOEFL score. Um, so you know that could potentially save you thirty dollars. And that's for multiple applications that would really save uh, you a lot of money. So mm -hmm. definitely reach out and check with them. And if they don't require it, then you'll not have to send that in as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good tidbit. I feel like anything you can cross off the list as far as anything, the requirement yeah. is helpful. And also having like a proper plan, because sometimes even like she said, the West really takes a lot of time because of COVID, it was all delayed. And some of my um, packets even got lost in the mail. And I don't know if they even reached the program. Even now, I don't know if they reach the program. So um, I think it's very important because there are a lot of things to keep track. So if there are these small things, um, if you can get that out of the way and you know, if you know that they don't require it or if it's not compulsory and they say it's fine, you don't have to submit it, you don't have to do it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, It really does um, help that way. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Uh, well, I'm so excited for you guys to start your programs in the fall or start start at Emory in the fall for both of you and to see see what comes of your genetic counseling training. So thank you for thanks for sharing all of the advice and helpful tips today.
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for you know offering this opportunity to do this video. I think it will be such a great resource. And Sharanya and me would have loved to have something like this, uh, you know, when we were applying. And I know how helpful it would be for other students who are applying this cycle as well, this upcoming cycle. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. I think this is a really great, um, you know, it's a very great resource. And like she said, it would be really helpful if we had this sort of guidance. Um, but, you know, we it's okay. We are no complaints. We still had Discord. We you still, made it. Um, had a lot of other, yeah, we made it. And, you know, the community has been very helpful um, in general. So, you know, it was always easy for us to reach out and get of uh, any advice be it like having our personal statements read or you know like looking at the cv or something like that uh, and all of that helps so i would just say don't hesitate to put yourself out there try to get as much um, help as you can because everyone's willing to offer um, their help and their advice and everyone has this experience everyone's been through this it's a difficult journey and ever and you know that every gc you're talking to has been through this so they definitely know what they're saying when they're helping you out. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of people are really shy, you know, to just send it out and be like, I don't want to send my personal statement or something like that. But it's scary. You don't, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I think you should just reach out. It'll really be helpful. Yeah, that's good advice. Sometimes easier said than done, at least for, for me it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, that's it for the interview. I'm sure you found some useful tips in there if you're thinking about applying as an international student. Thank you so much, Sharanya and Vanessa, for sharing all of that knowledge that you accumulated. Again, if you haven't liked and subscribed, please do so if you enjoy my content, and we'll see you next week.